So good evening, everybody, and welcome to Dealing with Injury and Return Today. Um, this is what the topic we have on this evening, and I want to welcome you all. We are really pleasure to have Katie Hotley with us tonight. Katie is a physiotherapist, and she went to the University of Ulster Jordanstown, um, where she was qualified, and is a ladies' gillig footballer herself for Derry. Um, she's played for many a years. She's probably thinking too many now at this stage. Uh, she's been a dynamic in the middle of the park for them and a key store home, I think, in centre half back and I've even seen her in the forwards on occasion. Um, she reigns from Derry City and her club is Stevens Town, where she's won a no numerous amount of county titles and I'm sure she'd like to get back onto the pitch and win a few more. Um, so we're delighted to have Katie with us. It's her first time doing a webinar for ladies football and I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, as I've said previously, if anybody who's joined us would like to ask any questions, you can do throughout the series as we move forward. Um, so I'm going to let Katie introduce herself to you and um, we'll get moving on with the webinar. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> um, hello. So as Claire mentioned there, um, my name's Katie. Um, Claire asked me to this webinar um, a week or so ago and I was just sort of thinking, why has she asked me? So how do we think to myself? And why I was probably <clears throat> a good candidate for this was um, due to the fact that I'm a physiotherapist and that I play Gaelic football and I have a bit of a history myself dealing with um, long-term injuries. So kind of a good fit in that regard. Um, I'm going to try and make it as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions at all, just fire away. I do speak pretty quick because as Claire mentioned, I'm from Derry, Derry City. So if I'm speaking too quickly, just tell me to slow down. Um, or if I'm rambling a bit. Okay, so um, if I was going on a webinar, I'd like to know a wee bit about the person that was doing it. So just to uh, reintroduce it, I'm 28 years old. I'm a physiotherapist um, and I work in a private practice in Derry and I work for Derry City Football Club. And as I mentioned before, um, I have my own sort of history dealing with more long-term injuries. I've been lucky enough not to have any niggles or any short-term injuries, but kind of went all out when I did do them. So I have had two ACL reconstructions, one in uh, 2014 when I was in my second year at uni, which was a tough pill to swallow because um, anyone who's been at uni or is at uni now at the minute, you know how important it is for your um, social side of things at uni and meeting people, meeting people from different counties as well and different backgrounds. And to have that kind of taken away um, at 21 was tough to swallow but it was my first time ever having any type of an injury so I kind of just took it in stride and <clears throat> made a good recovery got back playing football and just this year in 2021 June there I tore my ACL on my opposite leg which was another bitter one to swallow and we're still kind of processing that one at the minute um, so I got surgery for that uh, in August just 12 weeks ago today and I'm hoping to make a return next year um, so the rehab for that one is just ongoing, tipping along, um, lengthy, uh, rehab to do, but I have to do it. So, uh, that's just a wee bit about myself. Okay. So looking specifically at, um, ladies Gaelic football, um, despite the fact that there was uh, a lengthy pause due to COVID last year, there was still a massive big spike in injuries. Um, considering the fact that we weren't playing as much and we weren't training for a period of, I don't really remember now, about five, six months where we weren't able to get on the pitches, we weren't allowed um, to have collective type of training. So what we did not say a lot of us is we pounded the roads or we hit the home gym setup. Um, but we weren't really being exposed to that type of demands of the game where there's lots of twisting and turning um, and high intensity and tackling as well. Something that we weren't really exposed to when you're out running your 5Ks is a nippy cornerback trying to chase you and you're trying to run away from them. So for that period um, that <clears throat> we were training during COVID on our own, get back into training then and there was a massive spike, as you can see there with some of the statistics that's based on the injury fund claims to the LGFA. Um, so you would think that for the year that was on it, when we weren't training as much, weren't playing as games, that number would come way, way down, but it's still right up there, um, nearly 2,000 in 2021. Um, my that, own. That, that number though, the 2021, that isn't even end a claim 
year. So Aye. there is yeah. probably still nearly 200 teams to go into there. And, and as you say, I think 2020, Katie's probably the biggest one that stands out to me. We only were playing football for nearly five months of that year. That's why it's so frightening. Um, and my claim's not even in that one yet. So <laughs> there'll be another one out of it. Um, so sort of thinking like, why has that happened? It just anyone with a bit of common sense would think we're not playing, we shouldn't get injured. So um, whenever I was working last year, we we'd done lockdown, there was no furlough. We just kept working. And you're kind of rubbing your hands thinking I might get a handy summer here. You know, no one's playing any football. It went through the roof with um, Achilles injuries, hamstrings, quads and knee injuries. Absolutely spiked. Um, just when we got back to training last June, June 29th was whenever we had our first collective training session. And from June 30th onwards, that's the summer we've had in work. Um, again, I think a lot of this is related to road running during lockdown and then getting back on the pitch and the demands of even training and then games. Um, and then increased intensity that came with the enthusiasm of being away from it for so long and then the condensed season that came along with that so trying to squeeze as many club and county games and friendlies just out of pure enthusiasm getting back playing was kind of asking for trouble in the long run um it's just something that we could probably learn from um in terms of off seasons and pre-seasons and what way we can address those type of spikes in the injury when we get back to play all right, so if we look more specifically then at um, Lady Gaelic Football, sorry, I'm just trying to find my slide there. Um, so, Claire, if you move on to the next one, I think, yes. is there another one there? Or do you know, I'll go back to that last one, sorry. Sorry, there we go. Um, so, yeah, number one for Lady Gaelic Football is, is knees. Um, that's not a surprising statistic. Uh, we know that males can damage their ACLs as well but it's a lot more frequent it's actually eight times more likely in females um the reason for that is it's multifactorial but basically it comes down to a combination of anatomical differences and biomechanical differences so basically how we're made up and how we move is different to how men move and that's why knees for us for females are a bit more vulnerable um and then moving on down a lot of it still stays with the um lower limb being a bit more affected i think it accounts for 58% of injuries in females would be to the lower limb. Um, so your hamstrings, ankles, and knees, um, and quadricep muscle as well. All right. So, um, yeah. So Gaelic football for ladies, it is, it's grown at a really, really fast pace at the moment. And these types of injuries, they're, they're inevitable. Um, and like I mentioned before, there's a lot more information known about um, the men's game and injuries for them compared to females. So something that we kind of need to look into a wee bit more. Um, but as I mentioned, we do know that across both codes, lower limb um, are more, more common. Um, but it's important to know just that um, you're more likely to get those types of injuries. Um, if you look at that last wee statistic there, that 42.48. So that means that there's that many injuries happening per thousand hours of playing, and that's in a game. So more likely to pick up an injury in a match than we are training. Um, that's a statistic coming from a research paper. And in my own experience, that's definitely more true. Just because we train or we we play harder than we probably train. So something for coaches as well as players to maybe look at is really trying to bring in the intensity that you would in a game into your training as well. Um, and highlights the importance of implementing regular injury prevention programs as well for ladies Gaelic footballers. So, and would you do a Pacific, Katie, uh, injury prevention warm up as part of your warm up? Is that something you would have done or something you're encouraging? When I first tore my first, uh, when I first did my ACL in 2014, it's something I personally thought I need to take control of this. And I did do my own sort of warm ups and stuff. Um, we're lucky that, I suppose, at county level as well, but at our club, our coaches are really good at doing, you know, the guy activate warm up. Yeah. And Try to mix it up each week so it's not the same thing being spat out but it's getting the same components um so we're quite lucky in that regard um the evidence is there just to say how effective it is so it is very important um so just looking at injury specifically now so after an injury um athletes have to just completely start navigating a new road that is just foreign to them especially with something you know you've never had before maybe a young player or maybe you're an older player who's just got lucky and never picked up that many injuries um, so if we look at some of these questions here, like, why has this happened to me? 
do I need to see a physio? Do I need to see a surgeon? Should I just keep training? Just keep playing games? When will I play again? Ian, will I return to the same level? Will my insurance cover this? And will I need to take time off work? I would say that every single one of those questions has crossed my mind in the past like 12 weeks. Um, and just trying to find the right answer from the right person sometimes is a bit of a task. Um, so a lot of people question why is it happened to me, especially if you know you do all the intervention, you go to the gym, eat right, you sleep right. Sometimes it just comes down to bad luck, and that is really difficult for people to accept sometimes. Um, so that's a tough one. In terms of a physio and surgeon, um, if you have any injury that's making you stop training and not play games, first thing I'd be doing is asking a physio, and then they can nearly answer the rest of the questions for you and just get a bit of help there. Um, it can be really overwhelming. You know, if you've had, even if it is just something that's reoccurring, maybe a hamstring, it's maybe not putting you off work but it's frustrating you to the point that you're like, well, will I get back? Will I get my sprint back? Will I be able to hit, you know, 45? Will I be able to do all those things again? Um, so I'm lucky that with my job, when I got injured, I didn't have to go looking too far for any of these answers. But my advice would be that if this is just new to you, go and get as much information as possible and give yourself the best chance of recovery and make the best informed decision you can for each and every one of those um, questions. Um, and with the LGFA or with insurance as well, <clears throat> I've been lucky that um, dealing with them, uh, they're really, really good, give you a lot of information and their response time is lightning. So if you get, if you email them in the morning, they'll get back to you really quickly. So it's quite time sensitive with injury forms. So just get them, get the ball rolling early. If it's something that is you're going to be eligible, eligible for as well, would be the best bit of advice. Yeah, and a lot of the, the bigger stuff has to be pre-approved and stuff. So we do have a, an injury um, fund webinar. So anybody that's going through this at the minute, if you look at it on YouTube, it lasts for like 25, 30 minutes and it's a brilliant um, guide for you to help you through that process. I suppose that's just a wee tip. Hi, perfect. Um, so just moving on now and looking at something that I see a lot in work <clears throat> with athletes of all backgrounds is that they can have a bit of an identity crisis following an injury. So as we know, playing football, um, I feel like football does take a lot of sacrifice and commitment to make it to your training sessions, gym sessions um, and games. And for some, your whole life can just revolve around that. I know for, at a stage last year, I was just packing a bag and going to work, going to training, coming home and unpacking that bag and doing that consistently. It wasn't a chore. It was just something that you, you wanted to do. Um, but it's kind of your whole life at a stage. And when that's taken away from you, you're just going, what do I do now with all this free time? Um, and a lot of things that we can get from sport would be like, it gives you your confidence, your self-esteem, friendships, and it's a big thing for stress relief as well. So after an injury, you're kind of dealing with all those things just being taken away from you. Um, so after an injury also, like a lot of people would have a, a negative response. So which is only expected, a lot of anxiety, denial, grief, frustrate, frustration. Um, and you can have that wee bit of a, a loss of purpose um, and loss of motivation and control of the situation as well. And you kind of ask yourself, who am I without my sport? Um, so a lot of things I would just say is try and stick around the team as best as you can if it's something that's going to help you. I know I kind of struggled being anywhere near training or matches when this first happened and I'm coming around to the idea now. But if it's giving you a bit of confidence and letting you still be part of it, then um, try to stick around because even though you mightn't feel like you're able to contribute, your presence sometimes can give the team a wee bit of a lift. Um, so it's just trying to navigate your way through all that after an injury can just, it can be really overwhelming. So following on for that, from that then, um, as we know, injuries can be physically and mentally challenging for athletes. So it's really important to have um, some form of coping mechanism to help you deal with this and try and manage those types of negative thoughts and make a full recovery. So if you're getting feelings of denial and frustration and anger, um, trying to have these mechanisms, these coping mechanisms in place. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at some of the evidence regarding following an injury, a lot of people, or a lot of evidence would suggest that how someone copes with the stress of an injury will actually determine the outcome that they'll have returned to sport, which is very, very important. So how you deal with the injury will directly influence what type of a comeback that you'll have following an injury. 
Um, with other research also saying that a positive psychological response um, is more likely to determine a successful return to sport to the previous level of participation and as, actually at a quicker rate than those who have a negative response. So for that reason, all these coping mechanisms are going to be very important. So three different types of, um, well, there's a variety of different coping strategies that can be implemented. I'm just going to talk about these three. Okay, so there's um, emotional focus coping to start with. So this is trying to develop some type of skills that help you process and work through any type of unwanted emotions. So in other words, this approach sort of helps you manage emotions rather than the outside circumstances. All right, so the approach won't exactly solve the problem directly, but it's a really good tool for dealing with the situations, um, especially those that are just out of your control. Um, so for example, things like meditating, keeping a diary of your recovery, which is something that I find really useful with some of the patients that I have in work and easier said than done, positive thinking. I know sometimes that's a really tricky one. So trying to find the silver lining or reframing the situation and gaining a fresh perspective. Um, for example, if training is consuming a whole lot of your time, you pick up an injury, you don't need to go to training anymore. You have a bit more time in your hands. So maybe for some people, that's a silver lining um, to have a bit more time to you know see their friends or family or whatever it might be. Um, another sort of approach in this form or, or this strategy would be you know, just talking to people, friends or family or those that like a trusted network. Um, to people that use emotional focused coping strategies tend to be a bit more resilient to the stress that they may have following injury, which can only have a positive influence. Now, avoidance coping, this sometimes can be a bit harmful. And this is the equivalent to just kind of digging your head in the sand and wanting everything to, to go away and hoping that you know this isn't really, really happening to you. Um, trying to avoid direct or dealing with it sort of head on. Um, this can lead to issues further down the line. And I've seen it as well in work um, where people kind of, they lose interest in the recovery. They're like, I don't want to do my rehab. I'm not going to go to physio. I don't really want to keep fit. I'm just going to they kind of let themselves go a bit. Um, and I've seen that with people where they've just lost their love for sport and it's really hard to kind of reignite them and get them back on. So that's something, if it can be avoided, just trying to not dig yourself into that, that hole, really. And then <clears throat> the third one there is problem-focused coping. This is a really good one. So this is just a really positive strategy where you just face it head on, take, the, um, take more active role in your recovery. Um, something that's really important for people that are dealing or that have this type of strategy would be setting goals. So maybe you've sprained your ankle, but you want to improve your upper body uh, strength. So you set a goal that by the end of you know two weeks, you want to be able to do a pull up or twenty push ups, something like that that allows you to keep training uh, without sort of affecting the tissue that's healing. Um, that can be a really good way to keep you motivated or even saying that you want to work on your, your weaker side if it's something that can be done without harming the injury further. So there's lots of different ways that you can try and cope after an injury. That's just a few that I've kind of seen and that I've been using personally as well. So moving on then, just to be thinking of what actions can we take? So what is the, the plan of attack? I mentioned before there, um, Goal setting, very, very important after an injury, whether it's really big or small injury. Um, look at it like, like a challenge. So you can be down in the dumps for a few days, but then you kind of have to dust yourself off if you want to make a recovery. Um, so if you set some goals and you monitor, monitor them, so keeping a diary, you'll be able to see some sort of improvements. And that will help with your confidence and motivation as well in the gym. Sometimes you see people doing rehab and they... They haven't set goals. They're kind of guessing it. You ask them where they're getting on and they're like, I grand, I'm getting on okay. But you know that they're not too sure. Um, so that's why goal setting is just good because it keeps you on target and it keeps you, it keeps you really focused as well. Um, so another thing I was mentioning there about pull-ups or sit-ups, or maybe you want to be a bit more flexible, like you want to touch your toes by the time you get back playing. Um, you know, things that might indirectly affect your game but it's just a good form of kind of distraction as well. So and somebody's asked here, how important is the, the accountability factor for the recovery? And, and, and another one saying, um, 
what about making sure you're doing the exercise properly or having mm -hmm. somebody you, maybe you're unsure of the gym work if you're returning from injury so friend, so, that? Um, so accountability is massive for rehab if you don't have accountability what, what motivation do you have other you know you need to have someone kind of checking in on it every every week or so to see what your progress is and it makes you accountable for your own work at the end of the day you can go to physio all you want but they can't actually do the rehab for you they can spoon feed you and they can tell you what to do but unless you are accountable for it and take responsibility um it's not going to make a huge difference unless you actually go and do it uh in terms of keeping accountability you need to keep record of what you're doing so i just keep notes on my phone and then i look back on it and say right last week i did this as a squat in terms of weight this week i want to do that and i can look back and say I'm being responsible for my own rehab. I'm being accountable. Um, and that helps you note your, your improvements as well. So accountability is definitely huge. And then in terms of, was it making sure you do the right exercises, was it? Yeah. Are you being right? sure of the gym? You know, some, some people are afraid of, oh, uh, maybe they didn't, haven't done squats before or yeah. RDLs or mm -hmm. any of that stuff. So if you go, go to a physiotherapist, usually the first thing they'll do for any type of injury in the lower limb is do a squat. And then they should be able to tell you what you're doing well and things that you need to work on. So go to physio or even uh, SNC coaches are brilliant at telling people, you know, what, what's good and what's bad about their squat and how to improve it as well. So SNC coaches, physios, really, really good with that. Um, in terms of the gym environment, it can be really intimidating um, if it's something that maybe you're new to. Or even if it's not new, I know people who go to the gym every day and sometimes still get a bit of a panic when they walk in. Um, go with your friends. Definitely try and bring a team member along with you. I know at our club at the minute, there's three or four people out with injuries. So it's just a matter of sending them a text and saying, I'm going to the gym. Do you want to come with me? Um, and even if they come the first couple of times, then you get a bit more confident. You might be okay on your own if they can't make it. Um, so gyms can be daunting, but just remember that everyone in there is looking at themselves in the mirror and no one's looking at you either. So everyone's fussed on themselves um, and try not to be too overwhelmed by them. Um, so looking at ed educating yourself as well after an injury, it might be the first time you've ever, ever had an injury or maybe you've had a couple before, but the most uh, important step is definitely knowing what, what's your diagnosis, what, what is your injury, where is it, what are your treatment options? Um, what, are, what are the purpose of the exercise that you're being given? Like, what are they trying to do? Um, and what should you really expect during your rehab? You need to kind of know some of the, uh, most of those questions there in order to know if you're on the right track. Um, and also asking if there's any sort of other exercises that you could be doing safely. And if there's any type of warning signs that you're maybe doing a bit much or you might be hindering a wee bit of the injury as well. So that's really, really important. Um, and just to point on that one as well I had two people last year who they were both ACL injuries as well and one was a male and one was a female uh both footballers and they had completely different approaches and completely different outcomes the female incredibly proactive asked lots of questions took a huge interest in rehab enjoyed the rehab weirdly got really into it um whereas the male just kind of he wouldn't have been able to tell you what, what exercises he was doing, why he was doing them, you know, what, how long he was going to be injured for. He just kind of went through the motions of it. And unfortunately, he had a poor outcome when he went back to play, retore his ACL and is going through the whole thing again. So I just hope that this time around, maybe he's a bit more proactive and responsible with it. Whereas the female, on the other hand, is you know, back playing and going really well. So a lot of evidence for just educating yourself around the injury as well. Um, and then support, support's really, really important. So a common thing to do after an injury is either just, just hide away from the world, uh, hide away from teammates, coaches, friends, um, cause you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to accept it. If it's a bigger injury that you're going to be out for quite a while. Um, but it is really important to maintain that type of contact with people when you are recovering, um, cause they can listen to you. You can vent the way to them. They can give you some advice and encouragement during your rehab as well, which is only going to help you. And it is important to surround yourself with positive people. They can, they can cheer you on and sort of lift your morale a wee bit whenever you're feeling discouraged. Um, so I kept my own training routine. So I was down training normally a couple of nights a week at six o'clock. I still would go down after work, same routine. And you're still kind of part of the team and you're seen 
as like a visible member of the team when you're actually there as well, rather than just kind of hiding away in the gym, like go over, maybe watch a bit of training, chat to a few people. Um, something like that's usually quite useful. And then a big one is no matter how big or small, if you've had a wee bit of a, a one in your rehab, maybe being able to you know, bend your knee a wee bit further or you can run pain-free, is reward yourself, give yourself credit. Um, don't be too hard down on yourself if you're not where you were before, if you think things are going kind of slow, just be patient with it and reward yourself. Um, like I love buying myself a new pair of trainers or gym gear, things like that just kind of keep me going. Um, Cause you know, if you've got new gym gear, you're more likely to kind of go to the gym and do some work. Um, and the last we one there as well is just dealing with fitness. So depending on the type of injury, you might be able to sort of modify your training uh, and do alternative forms of training just to maintain your overall fitness and sort of strength and conditioning. So if you can't run, maybe you can cycle, maybe you can go swimming. Um, you can work on your sort of uh, flexibility uh, or focus on your nutrition, things that maybe you kind of took the back seat because they weren't done all as exciting or maybe you just felt you didn't have time. So um, all, all those sort of things there are really good just for a general plan of action after you've picked up an injury. If you were to pinpoint sort of one of them in, in your action plan, yeah. uh, just for you personally, what do you think is, is the most important? It's a tie between goal setting and probably support because without goal setting, you're guessing 100%. People will say, I'm doing all right, but they don't actually know. I can say with confidence, I know where I'm at with my rehab based on numbers that I'm recording. Um, so goal setting is important. And sometimes you don't reach your goals and that's fine as well because we're being realistic with it. Things don't always go to plan. But as long as you can then put in a plan of action to reset that goal, maybe make it more achievable or a bit more realistic, then that's grand. You can just get back on track. And then support. Um, maybe that's just for me, but I was training six days a week and then now I'm, I'm not kicking football for the foreseeable. Um, I can go to the gym and I can do stuff, but you still struggle with maybe, you know, run championship time when everyone's won in championships and you're there but you're and you're part of it but you're not you know you don't feel like you're part of it so that one definitely for me and it, it doesn't need to be your friends that play Gaelic it can be someone who hasn't a clue about Gaelic which is sometimes really refreshing like um I know people I say, how do you how do you how do you pick the right people to support you if, you if you don't if you can't look at the football team anymore you know because every time you look at them to say you're out for the year and you think every time you go into training you become more down you yep. know it's trying to find what better qualities and other people to support you I suppose that's it I'd say like a large portion of my circle of friends are people that are like you know play some form of sport and a lot of those specifically would be um Gaelic footballers but away from that then a couple of friends that have no idea about football they are like oh sure you're out for a wee while you'll be grand you play next year and they're just refreshing because they haven't a notion and it's scary things that some of them are physios and they probably should know better but um they just have a really refreshing it looked like or at least you, know, you can go a few more nights out or you can go on that hen party or you can do this, you can do that. So sometimes they give you a really like glass half full type of look on it because well, they don't get the commitment and the love of it, but it's kind of refreshing just to chat to people like that. So for me, probably goal setting and um, support and definitely buy yourself new trainers all the time. That's <laughs> definitely what help. <laughs> helps me. Um, so just speaking of, of goal setting as well actually so one of my own strategies to kind of keep myself motivated um I just decided when I was getting surgery right I'm going to try and do videos of different stages of my recovery and this was basically for my own sanity I was off work had a lot of time in my hands and I found myself just kind of thinking all right I, this I could go looking for excuses not to do this but I have got the time and it's given me a great sort of record of my progress and how far you've come because there's days when you just kind of go this is crap I can't run I can't do anything my knee's sore and then you look back and you go oh hang on I've come so far and that was only a week ago or that was six weeks ago and it gives you a good sort of look into your your progress um but I think you can press play on one of those the left one maybe and it'll play but um one thing that I think is important is that like social media is you could type in hamstring in the social media and it's Instagram or ankle and you'll have like thousands of videos and pictures of people doing hamstring rehab. Um, so it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, but the important thing to remember of that is that it's like a highlight reel. No one ever puts up 
the bad things or the exercises that they're no good at, not good at. So there's plenty I'm not good at. And I just fire them up and just say, this is where I am at now. And I hope to be, you know, further down the line, doing it a wee bit better. So if I do an exercise and I'm absolutely rubbish at it, I still just, I'll just still put it up. And it's good for me to look back on and see if I'm on track. And I think that'll hopefully help people in a similar situation if they see that I'm doing it and they're like oh she's crap at that and I'm doing that I'm also about rubbish at it that's grand and then in a few weeks time you can see the improvement then they might go oh right okay so we got a light at the end of the tunnel um so that's just something I've been trying to do to keep me sanity um kind of touching on what I was just saying there but this is just a quote that I kind of always think is very relevant when it comes to injuries so comparison is the thief of joy basically you know when you're involved with sport that comes with a level of competitiveness I know I suffer from that um naturally you're constantly looking at you know others and thinking I want to try and be faster at them in the next sprint around the pitch or I want to try and block them down when they're they're going for a shot it's just natural and you play good like football I'm sure there's a level of competitiveness um with you as well and one thing with that is you compare yourself to people that have similar injuries. So people could have ankle sprains and think, God, they're, they're taking ages to get back or vice versa. They're thinking, you know, they, I came back after really quickly after my ankle injury, but there's just so many other things to kind of, um, you know, everyone's different. Everyone has a different injury history, different jobs. So they maybe have a bit more time to dedicate to their recovery, um, different ages, different motivations, different positions on the pitch, different demands um so all those things are really important if you're ever looking at someone and thinking jeepers I pulled my hamstring the same time as them and they're flying just consider the whole picture and maybe there's reasons why they are where they are and why you are where you are and try not to be too bogged down it so just focus on your own recovery and try not to look too far ahead just focus on the the present um and usually the bigger picture kind of comes together in the long run so um Thinking then about um, <clears throat> after any type of an injury, whether it's a major or minor injury, um, you want to be able to get back playing. That's the overall goal. So big thing before you get back to playing is um, mental readiness. So you can be physically ready, you can be 100%, but I say if a lot of people who they just struggle, they grasp the mental side of things. So you could do all the strength testing, all the plyometric tests, everything, you get them, run them under the ground and they'll say, I'm 100% my ankle or my knee or my quad feels brilliant. And you go, right, are you ready to play? And they go, no, no. Because there's the fear of, you know, doing it again or the, there's just so many emotions around it, especially if you kind of didn't have the right coping mechanisms at the start. This is when they might sort of come to the surface as well. So um, it's really important that you're ready physically and mentally um because failure to be prepared mentally can lead to just mentioned there the reduced performance um a reduced confidence which can lead to a decline in performance which then can cause feelings of anxiety and stress due to lack of confidence and then you have an increased risk of re-injury so it can get kind of messy really quick so just make sure if you are at that stage where you're thinking i'm i'm getting back to play here but if you don't feel ready that's absolutely fine as well don't feel pressures from you know, coaches or other players because they maybe haven't been through what you've been through. So at the end of the day, it's your injury, your body. And if you don't want to put it in the line because you're mentally not yet, there yet, that's that's completely fair. And that's your call as well. Um, because the last thing anyone wants to do after an injury is re-injure the same area because then you're kind of back to the start drawing board again of everything. So mental readiness is very important. Um, so do you have any tips of uh, I even just you know jumping in my head straight away I think everybody knows somebody I have a good friend who did their knee uh, their ACL and it, it nearly took her three years to get back every mm -hmm. time there, there was even a, a tip on the pitch or a, she felt mm -hmm. her knee turn anyway I had, a, I had to come off and I mean now she's in the best shape of her life but mm -hmm. just if she feels a knock on that at all it's so hard I she's terrified of it happening again probably yeah. and you see unless you've been in the gym on a long during a long winter and the dark nights and the coldness and you just think this is the pits and you just really appreciate when it's the pain's gone away and you've got that good function back and you're kind of enjoying training that when it comes to playing that game then you just think 
oh god maybe i'll just stay here maybe i'll just train and i'll not play but with acl specifically the reason you got a reconstruction which is what people forget is so that you can go back to sport it's not so that you can tip the toe or maybe walk the dog because then you would have been fine without the reconstruction you could have lived perfect with just great function and you didn't need to go through the surgery but you've been tough enough to go through the pain of the surgery tough enough to go through the pain of the injury and a lot of that does develop your mental um robustness 100 percent in situations away from sport like well it's work or in your personal life it does give you a bit of um just mental toughness as well um but the hardest thing is just crossing the line the first time to get um to get back in playing my advice is go on hard on a tackle early doors and that does help well or you're doing it or you're getting the tackle you stand up brush yourself off and then you realize your knee's not made of glass you've actually had a surgery that or an ankle you know or a quad whatever it is you've you've done the work um and it's it's strong it's grand but it's just getting that to kind of come together is it's so hard for people and it's understandable why you would struggle with that merging the physical and the mental straight mm-hmm. together That's exactly easier said than done i suppose um so how do we get mentally ready for um getting back to sport um so as i said i think before about there's a lot of evidence between the psychological readiness for return to sport and the ability for an athlete to kind of return to that pre-injury level if you're not psychologically ready you're probably not going to return to your previous level of play and then that's going to affect your confidence which is then just a vicious cycle of um like a a poor kind of uh, mental readiness for return to play so just to give a really grim statistic 50% 50% of ACL injuries um, will return to their pre-injury level. So what's happening in the other 50%? Um, a lot of that is probably coming down to their mental readiness and a fear because it's such a lengthy recovery. Um, and for me, this highlights the need for like a greater emphasis on uh, mental readiness for return to sport. It's something that is probably a bit grazed over. You know, if you, if you can do your stuff in the gym and you're running, you know, off you go and play. But that statistic alone, I think that a lot of that would attribute to the, the mental side of things as well, because after the surgery or doing the rehab, a lot of people are physically in, in good shape. Um, so just speaking from like my work, <clears throat> I've met a lot of people who've had a previous injury, whether it was you know, shoulder or hamstring or whatever, and they kind of just felt like they had no real direction on when to safely return to play. It was just like, go return to play, you'd be grand. And this just affected their confidence because they weren't sure if they were ready basically so one way to kind of incorporate that or try to overcome that is to try and incorporate some sports specific skills so whether it's just your own sort of on your own or getting down the training a bit earlier and doing you know grabbing someone down there and saying go on come and do a few drills with me whether it's shooting passing uh catching soloing or hitting 45s if you kind of can train some of those um, as well as doing the gym-based rehab before you get exposed to the full demands of the game Um, that can really really help with your with your confidence Um, and towards the end stage of your rehab then if you've done a good stint of it and you're feeling good going back to goal setting then you can kind of aim to do the warm-up with the team um, or join in on some small-sided games and doing something familiar will sort of dramatically improve your your enjoyment and your confidence whenever you, you do get back to playing um but all in all when it comes to mental readiness i think that like for a safe return to sport players need multidisciplinary um support definitely so they need um and the motivation goal setting which is all going to come from coaches friends family physios snc coaches um anyone that can help you and you need that encouragement to ensure that there's that positive emotional response and hopefully that try and minimize any delays in return to play and try to reduce the risk of re-injury as well. So mental readiness, very, very important. And then just to kind of finish up, um, just to keep in mind that no matter what the situation is or what the injury is and how good or how bad you might think that you're doing, the expectation is to have you know smooth out combat in reality things come up and there'll be bumps in the road that are maybe out of your control um so if things aren't going your way just focus on the wee ones um during your rehab whether it's something really really small minor or if it's a really big one just focus on that and keep yourself um motivated on that 
take breaks during your rehab. If you feel like you need it, I say it to a lot of my patients, um, if it's a, it's a rehab that's going on for a long period, I just say, take, take, like, take a week to yourself. Now you can still go to the gym, but maybe get away from the rehab, do some upper body or do some, something that's a bit more crack maybe if they can, or just avoid the gym altogether. Maybe just sit and watch Netflix for a week, just something to try and take your mind off the rehab. If you feel like you are getting bogged down on it. And it's, one other thing as well is that when you are setting your goals, just <clears throat> make sure that they are aligned with the physio and coach and that you're working for the, the best possible outcome. So you don't want people kind of setting these pie in the sky goals or you don't want people lowballing themselves either. So just speaking to someone like a physio or a coach or even a friend who can kind of work with you in your goal setting um, will help you have a smoother outcome. But at the end of the day, there's always going to be a few a few bumps along the way. Um, and that is, that is the lot for me. Any great, questions? Thanks so much. There's so much in, in that. Um, so it was great to hear. And uh, mm. I'm just going to see if anybody has any questions for us. I know there was one that did come in there that said, do you think it's easier to rec to rehab with somebody with the same injury with you or different injury? Hmm. It's interesting. Um, I suppose it depends if they're really far ahead of you and you maybe when I got injured last month and they got injured a few months ago or you know if there's a time difference in the injuries as long as you remember that there is a time difference and that's why they're maybe doing x y and z and you're not um I think that can help I know people who have had um knee injuries who you kind of can peg together and you can say right well there's six months and you're three months so in six months time what they're doing now or three months time you can kind of look forward to doing that type of fun stuff that they're doing but for now you'll only get to do that if you're um doing the groundwork now um it can be just a change of scenery as well to do rehab with someone who maybe they've never done anything like that before um just so if maybe they can throw in a few wee days as well for maybe upper body exercises if it's an ankle that you're rehabbing or something like that so I just think if you can get to the, the gym with a pal, that's definitely any, um, that will help loads. So definitely try to do that if you can. I think even the social aspect as well, if it's something, especially you're so used to being in a team sport and a team environment. Mm -hmm. I, I'm doing rehab at the minute, both of us are. And okay. um, I know I would have been lost only, I have people to talk to beside me. Now we're all in completely different programs. There's three of us training at the same time, but we're completely, completely different programs. But I just even like the chatting between the reps, you know. Hi, it's a crack, isn't it? You know, yeah. it, it definitely helps me because I wouldn't be a big gym goer. So it just helps me go four times a week now and I'm going to to talk to somebody. Aye, uh, no, that's it. Because like you say, if you're part of a team and then you're just there on your own, it's just, it's a rubbish, isolating feeling. So if you can get anyone in, even if it is a few chats before in between reps, it's only going to help. So definitely. What about the, the importance of, I suppose getting the advice from the right people, Kitty. As you said, a lot of people go on Google, and um, and we we're short of an industry now that we think we can Google everything for the answer. Yeah. So, uh, oh, I know. Have, I we think that was the best idea, would it be? I know. I've had a, a few people come in. And they say, "I saw this in Google. I saw that in Google," and you just like you start banging your head up against the wall nearly. Um, you have to be able to make the best formed decisions decisions for yourself. Then at age, it's your it's your injury. Um, so. All you can do is gather as much information as possible and you'll you'll get a gut feeling about someone if you trust them and you, you know you feel like you can work with them if they're not being a clear communicator and they're not telling you clearly what the issue is and what you need to do and giving you a good clear rehab program look elsewhere and make sure that you are going to it doesn't need to be a physio but make sure you are going to someone who is giving you the right help um definitely because a lot of people can be misinformed and that can attribute to sort of a breakdown in their rehab or further injury as well the last thing you want when you're after suffering any hip of injury is to feel a bit lost like i don't know what i'm doing so just gather up as much information um as you can would be the best thing so going to someone that you trust i suppose there is loads of some support networks out there so mm -hmm. i suppose a big message probably is just to reach out you know mm -hmm. take that take the first step and actually reach out to somebody if you're feeling that wee bit you know I don't wait for them to take you because they mightn't <laughs> do so you take it's it's like rehab as well you have to take responsibility for um the head as well so if you feel like you're really really struggling send out the message do you want to go for coffee do you want to go for a walk do you want to go to the gym 
it could be completely unrelated to sport. It could be going to watch a match, anything like that. Um, because without that support network, you can kind of spiral a wee bit and get down in the negative and be class half empty. And it's fair enough to have days like that. I know I have days each week where I'm going, I couldn't be bothered with this. But then you go to the gym, you dust yourself off and you chat to some of your friends and you, they go, geez, you're walking better. Or, well, you look what you're doing now in the gym. And you kind of go, oh, because you're getting a fresh perspective on it. Whereas if you're not spending time with those people, only you can sort of, you're spending a lot of time yourself. You don't see improvements each day in yourself. But if you meet up with your friends, you know, a group of friends every Saturday for a coffee, they'll see a big improvement, um, hopefully, with everything, if you're doing the right rehab, I suppose, as well. Yeah, it's just so interesting. I think it's just a bit of a minefield topic. So it's, that's why we wanted to highlight it today. Um, Massive. And, and everybody, and I think it's probably important to realise this, is going to have a, a slightly different journey as well. No two mm-hmm. journeys, the ACL recovery are the same. No two knee journeys, no two ankle. But I think the important message that it, I think really clearly got across here we can all have the same sort of plan in terms of all be prepared, all have our goal set and get ourselves educated, get get a good support network around us. And the big one that I really took out of this is making sure we're mentally ready as well as oh, physically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Definitely very important. Uh, well, so, like I was saying, if 50% of A cells aren't returning to play, why? Do you know, I think a big part of that is the mental side of it as well. So it's um, yeah, that's the that was a take home message. I think maybe to investigate another night. Um, but Katie, thanks so much for giving us your time. It's been absolutely no brilliant to have you. Um, no it's been a pleasure, like always. And there's going to be so much learning from this webinar. And everybody's giving you loads of compliments, thanking you very much. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so everybody, go home and enjoy your cup of tea in your evening. And that's us for the evening. Thanks very much for logging in and tuning in. Um, Thank you. Here's Thank you. Thank you, folks. I'm just going to log off here.